Christmas is approaching and Britain wants a happy ending to a missing person story. He heard her phone ringing in her jacket pocket and I suspect that was probably the start of his nightmare. Joanna Yates would know her killer. His defence will be that her death was an accident. He put her hand around her throat and he squeezed and he squeezed the life out of her. As a nation mourned on Christmas Day, it was her family who were grief-struck. I do miss her. <laughs> December 17th, 2010. Office Christmas party time. Joanna Yates kisses her boyfriend Greg Reardon goodbye as he heads to Sheffield to visit his family. She then heads to a pub in Bristol. When she finished work, she joined workmates um, and she went out for a drink. She meets up with friends from her office where she works as a landscape architect. Joanna is very popular. She's really bubbly. She's had this incredible warmth about her as well. Jo moved from Hampshire for her job, but regularly returns. She's part of a close and loving family. Probably a lot of mums say this, but she's a friend, um, someone I enjoyed time with, someone um, who inspired me to do perhaps more unusual things than, than other people do or that I would have done. Jo is like a breath of fresh air, really. Generally happy, and buoyant, very, very positive. Joanna and Greg, both in the city to progress their careers, have recently moved to a basement flat in the pleasant suburb of Clifton. Living upstairs, their landlord is Christopher Jeffries, a retired English teacher, never married. He lives alone. He has no TV, preferring to spend the time with his books. He's also heavily involved in the day-to-day -day running of the building and his flats. I had come to a point where one of the flats that I let out um, for retirement income became vacant. Uh, and the, the very first day that it was advertised, uh, two of the prospective tenants turned out to be Joe Yates and Greg Reardon. I liked them very much. I absolutely did nothing at all about them which was unattractive. Um, I liked both of them. They were young, enthusiastic, anxious to set up home together for the first time and I was very pleased to be able to give them the opportunity to do exactly that in what they obviously thought was an ideal place for them. I think both of them were enjoying building a house together, mm. now acquiring the bits and pieces. Um, what young couples do. Yeah. yeah. And uh, they're very much a, 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 you know, a partnership. They're very much together. They're, uh, they're very happy together. The flat in Canning Road that they'd chosen to share was already home to Vincent Tabak, a young Dutchman also working his way up a career ladder. He left Holland for Britain after studying in Eindhoven. His expertise is in the field of people flow in public spaces. It's a specialised skill, much in demand in Britain. He grew up in a rural area of southern Holland. Uden is a very small town uh, in the south of the Netherlands. Very, very normal, very quiet, typical southern town where people celebrate carnival in February, very traditional. He was uh, this normal kid really he didn't have a lot of friends we know this that he didn't he didn't he played alone a lot of the times neighbors remember the youngest of four who has two sisters and a brother and they recall a pleasant quiet private boy just an ordinary guy as yeah 100 other guys <laughs> can be a little bit introvert uh, to himself uh, yeah i would say introvert yes Vincent becomes a student in Eindhoven in his late teens. He shines as a very good student, noted for his methodical, painstaking approach to problem solving. It's not easy to excel at this university, but he does. 
Eindhoven is officially the smartest region in the world and Vincent Tabak was one of the smart people. Vincent Tabak's work at university is not quite what it seems. Although he spends time plotting the movement of large groups, he spends little time with people. Instead, his is a virtual world lived largely in front of a computer screen. You know, it's maybe a little bit of a geeky university. Very intelligent computer boys who sit behind their screens designing stuff. And, um, and maybe that was what he was doing for about seven or eight years while getting his PhD is just be engrossed in his computer designing and, uh, you know, being very clever about it. Clever enough to be awarded his PhD. We know Vincent Tabak is a highly intelligent individual, that he's systematic in his approach to life. Like so many, he's never far from the web. Professionally, for work, he was a habitual user of the internet, as are many professional people. He used the internet to keep in contact with his girlfriend regularly. Tabak exudes different personas to different people. One minute awkward and preferring his computer screen for company, the next very sociable with those around him. He had always struck me and I think struck everybody else in the building as a thoroughly civilized and courteous person. He was a tenant who was in many ways ideal. It seems to be that different people describe him in quite different ways. So his family at home seemed to describe him as being quite shy, um, steady, calm, whereas his work colleagues in this country seem to describe him as being more outgoing. And these things are quite inconsistent. As Joanna heads towards the Ram pub, Vincent Tabak kisses his girlfriend goodbye. Vincent Tabak had also been at work. His partner, Tanya, had gone out to an office function that had taken her out of Bristol. And the plan was that he was going to pick her up in the early hours of the Saturday morning. He later tells friends that he took the opportunity to take pictures of the heavy snow that Britain was experiencing. At the Ram, Joanna shares a carefree seasonal evening. As ever, she's in demand, the life and soul of the party. Everyone that knew Jo absolutely loved her. She was um, just full of life and energy. After a couple of hours, she prepares to leave. In the basement flat, which is adjacent to hers, Vincent Tabak is eating a pizza, drinking a beer. He sends a text to his girlfriend. Joanna heads off to pick up her supper, stopping first at Waitrose, but doesn't buy anything. She pops into a shop to buy two bottles of cider. Later, these mundane details, captured forever on camera, will become vitally important as police piece together events. At 20 to 9, she's in Tesco's, where coincidentally, she also buys a pizza. Between 8.45 and 8.50, Jo is in her flat, preparing her supper. Later that evening, Vincent Tabak is in a supermarket where he texts his girlfriend. He makes a point of telling her that he's missing her loads. It's boring without you. He formed an intention at some stage in that evening to go out to Asda. I frankly found that a bit weird. And he bought one or two items of some rock salt. Asda was in Bedminster. It's a car drive away from the flat. There are plenty of shops in Clifton. If you needed to pop out for something, I would have expected somebody to go locally, especially given the weather conditions. Returning home, he goes onto the web. Now alone, he checks his work emails and returns to a world others do not know he inhabits, a world of pornography. Clearly, if you scrape beneath the surface, there was something about Vincent Tabak and his character and what he enjoyed viewing and doing that other people weren't aware of. He was looking at sites of violent pornography, um, the degrading of women, um, often sort of sadomasochistic practices, um, including strangulation. We also know that when he was away from home, when he was in America, and more on a trip that he had in Newcastle, 
that he looked for escorts. That Friday evening, he was alone. Under the same roof, a landlord and two tenants who could not have been more different. The bookish academic, the bubbly landscape architect, and the young professional who leads an online life obsessed with violent sex, something he keeps very secret. The three lives are about to become inextricably and tragically linked. Greg Reardon is with family in Sheffield trying to get in touch with his girlfriend, Joanna Yates. Now, over the weekend, he tried to contact her. He tried to text her. He sent text messages to her. He also rang her number and he rang the landline and hadn't got any response. Greg grows worried. It's unusual for Joanna not to keep in touch. He travels back to Bristol and encounters an empty flat. When Greg got back to the flat on the Sunday, Jo wasn't there um, and he tried to contact her. He heard her phone ringing in her jacket pocket. And I suspect that was probably the start of his nightmare. The mobile phone went quite near midnight and Greg's name flashed up on it, which I thought was unusual. And uh, then he said, is Joe with you? And we said, well, no, why will she be with us? And then he said, well, all her belongings are here, her purse, her keys and things like that. I got up on the Monday morning, noticed that I had a missed call on my phone from Greg at about half past 12 on the Sunday. So that was very, very unusual. There was no rationale to it. And so we decided then that we'd drive down to Bristol and we um, asked Greg to phone the police immediately. And in the early hours of the following morning, as far as I can remember, he made the phone call to the police to say that his partner, Joe, was missing. Greg had already gone through the bag that she, that she used to carry around and found Joe's wallet, glasses, everything really. The only person, the only thing of Joe's which wasn't in the flat was Joe herself. What particularly strikes Joe's mum, Teresa, when she arrives at the flat is a receipt which tells her that Joe had bought a pizza earlier in the night. But there was no evidence of the pizza in the flat. There was no packaging. And the fact that her boots were left in the flat and her coat was there, her keys, her purse, her phone. So you already started to think there's something not right with this and this could be a criminal investigation. Something has happened to Joe. Joe's mum frantically searches the neighborhood. We walked around the block just to sort of look in over walls to see either either the pizza or something to do with Joe or her clothes. And I remember sort of banging on boots of cars as well, just in case she'd been abducted and, and locked in. I mean, I knew there'd be no hope because it was so cold, but I, it's just not knowing what to do. It was bitterly cold, temperatures well below zero. At the house, signs of people who've walked on the lawn, Vincent Tabak and his girlfriend. I noticed these footprints going diagonally across the lawn, and I wondered where these came from. And I saw these two people, a shorter person and a taller person, walking along the same path, and I thought, ah, oh, they must have been the ones that caused it. As I was going to the flat, it stopped, and the smaller person was telling him, and she asked if she could help. And uh, the man stood well back away from things, didn't say anything. The police quickly sensed the seriousness of events. In the case of Joe, it was highly unusual. She hadn't done this before. There, were, there didn't appear to be any um, personal issues that she had that would mean that she would, she would walk away from home and not tell anybody. She wasn't on any medication of any sort. She didn't have any mental health issues. She didn't have a history of depression. So all of the indicators that sometimes would cause somebody to leave, leave home weren't there. So very early on, 